you don't have to do much in range management, whether you're managing livestock or wildlife, before you realize that the number of animals that are out on the range is going to affect the range and the animals, and it's important to manage the stocking rate of animals. So in this presentation, in principles of rangeland management at the University of Idaho, we're going to talk about setting stocking rates. I'm Karen Launchbaugh. Okay, we will talk about stocking rate, but there are other decisions that have to be made on the ground that fall in this general category of grazing principles. The first thing that one decides when they go to the range is what kind of animal to graze. In this case, we're going to talk about livestock species, type, and age of animal. So is it a cow-calf operation? It is a, a, a yearling ewe operation? It, what is it that you're trying to manage for on the range? Of course, we could talk about wildlife too, but it's much more difficult to select a species or type of, live, of wildlife and manage them. So in grazing management, we're usually talking about livestock principles. The next question is how many animals? How many animals are out on the range? How many should be out on the range? That is stocking rate. So we will talk today about stocking rate um, and how, you, how it's set and, and how we manage that. There's a few other things though. Uh, when should we graze the pasture? When should we not graze it? When should we rest it? When should we graze it? All of those questions about how one piece of land is grazed or rested fall under the category of grazing systems. We'll talk about that later in this course. And then finally, animal distribution. That's where animals graze on a landscape. Not surprisingly, animals don't graze landscapes just evenly all the way across. They have their sort of favorite places that they like to graze and rest. Those characteristics are behavioral characteristics that we'll talk about in animal behavior. But it's difficult to, animal, to manage animal distribution, but it sure can be done. So we'll talk about that later. Before we delve too far into stocking rates, we gotta get a few terms under our belt. And one is carrying capacity. So carrying capacity is the number of animals a piece of land can support for the long term without causing ecological damage. Of course, we know that all rangelands are grazed in some form or another. And so they have the ability to be sustained from year to year and be healthy with grazing occurring. But exactly how much is that? Well, that number is really determined by Mother Nature. What kind of vegetation is there? How much precipitation does it get? When does that precipitation come? That determines how much forage is produced. And then that would determine how, met, how many animals can graze it healthy over the years. Um, the term carrying capacity is usually expressed as a number of animals per some area for some number of time. And it, most often when you talk about carrying capacity, you talk about acres per animal unit month per year. Uh, we're going to talk about AUMs later, but that is a unit of animals and a unit of area and a unit of time, and that's what it takes to express carrying capacity. Stocking rate is a little bit different than that. Stocking rate is the number of animals a land manager decides to put on the land for a period of time. Sometimes they decide to stock less than carrying capacity, sometimes more. So again, that has three elements to it. It has a number of animals, usually expressed in animals or animal units. It has some area of land, usually expressed in acres and hectares. And it has some amount of time, days, months, years. So it is a really important decision that we make on rangelands. And the reason it's so important, because at its heart, the number of animals that you put on the land affect the rangeland health and the economic return, animal condition, which turns into economic return on an enterprise. Stocking rate then is that number of animals that you put on the land and at its heart, it is a balance between forage supply and animal demand. So we're gonna look at the supply, that's the amount of forage the land produces. And uh, in the stocking rate examples, we'll calculate that. We'll get some good idea of how many pounds per acre a piece of land produces. And then we're gonna look at how much do the animals eat? What is the forage demand? How much do cows, sheep, goats, horses, elk, whatever's grazing out there need to be sustained? So we know that a proper stocking rate is important because it affects both rangeland health and animal production and economics. So let's talk a little bit first about how does a proper stocking rate affect rangeland health. 
Deep in the theories of rangeland management, there is this idea that you could graze a pasture to some proper level of use, some level where you leave enough forage behind so that the plant can stay healthy and it has the ability to regrow, so and one eye on plant health, also leaving enough forage uh, supply behind for forage for wildlife, and then also thinking about leaving enough biomass and litter on the ground to prevent erosion. So at least those three things. We want plants to remain healthy after we graze a pasture, we want there to be forage for wildlife, and we want um, prevention of erosion. That all comes from the theory that when you remove the leaves, you're also affecting the roots. So to keep plants healthy and keep the ecosystem intact, you've got to also pay attention to how much root mass is left behind and how much is holding the soil down. Across the West, there have been a lot of research studies done by range scientists like me who look at if you had use year in and year out, how much could the land sustain and, uh, and still be happy? And that led to this idea of a proper use factor. And that is often the amount that you could remove. It's set below carrying capacity because you don't want to degrade the land. So it's a stocking rate that's set below carrying capacity. And it's based on utilization guidelines. OK, so for ecosystems like the sagebrush grasslands, studies have been done. And they say that year in, year out, you can remove 30 to 40 percent of the biomass, and the plants will still stay healthy. The short grass prairie had really heavy grazing by bison when it was evolving, so it can handle a little bit more. Its plants are a little more adapted to grazing, and they also get precipitation during the middle of the summer. So you can remove 40 to 50% of the biomass in the shortgrass prairie, and still um, that prairie will maintain itself. Higher elevations like coniferous forests and the oak woodlands and the benches, we generally think of them as um, being able to sustain 30 to 40%. So the bottom line is you can remove some amount of forage every year and still maintain a healthy ecosystem. We'll talk later in this class about how much it depends on what time of year that was removed, and uh, and also thinking about precipitation levels, drought, or, or good years. So why is the proper stocking rate important for an uh, animal production standpoint? Well, um, if you look at this graph, you know that you can see that on, at a low stocking rate, animals produce the, just exactly what they're able to produce, their genetic potential. And then at some point between sort of a low and moderate rate, um, every more as the stocking rate gets higher and higher and there's more and more animals in that pasture, uh, you're going to see each animal not gain as well as they could. And then at some point, there's going to be a rapid decline where you throw, put another animal on the ranch and all the animals are going to come back thinner. So let's focus on this kind of um, flux point where as you start to put more animals on the ground, on the pasture, uh, you, every, every animal comes back less, less heavy. Well, why is that? Why as you increase stocking rate, do individual animals respond by not getting as fat as they could? There's a few reasons. Uh, first, of the, as you get more animals in the pasture, there's simply less forage per animal. And then they choose among all that forage, and their diet quality is lower because they can't get the best of the quality forage out there. Plus, there's more energy required to get that forage. And they may have to travel further. They may have to go up to slope a little bit further than they would like. They may even have to just chew longer because it's lower quality. So they expend more energy to get what they can. And then finally, when you get a lot of animals in a small space, you can start to have issues with stress and disease, uh, where animals are passing diseases around and they, they just might be stressed because of the high number of animals in the area. So this doesn't happen until you get to really heavy stocking rates, but there is a point where when you add another animal to pasture, all of the animals suffer because they can't get enough forage, their diet quality is lower, it takes more energy to get the diet, and they're stressed and I hope I've convinced you then that it's really important to set the right stocking rate, both if you're interested in the health of the land and if you're interested in the productivity of animals and, of course, economic output from a ranching operation. So it's a very important decision. But herein lies a problem. You can understand why a stocking rate is important and you can do a pretty good job of setting it. But the problem is that the amount of forage that you're going to receive and be able to use on that land varies extensively from year to year, largely because of differences in precipitation from year to year and the timing of precipitation. 
you can calculate a long-term average, but it's going to be way below some years and way above other years. So how do you set a stocking rate in light of this level of variability? First of all, you really have to acknowledge that it, it's huge. Here's some graphs from uh, near Twin Falls, kind of actually a little past Burley. Uh, and it's you can see these pastures. You can see this. Uh, there's a, 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 a power line in the back, a wooden post. So you can kind of see that they're all being taken from the same spot. And in 1957, there was about 11 inches of rain, and the pasture got about 850 pounds per acre. In a couple years later, there was about the same amount of rain. It was 11 inches, but the forage production was half what it had been in 57. So something happened. The, the rain came at the wrong time of year. Maybe there were some other events, but there's a lot less forage in 59 than there was in 57. Oh, but my gosh, look at the next year, 1960. There's almost no forage out there. I don't think you could even really uh, rightfully think about putting animals out on this pasture. It's 186 pounds per acre. It, there's just nothing for them to eat. And then just a, a few years later, we had a bo boon year in 1971 where there was 16 inches of precipitation. It must have come at the right time because the precipitation was over 1,000 pounds. So here's a pasture where some years it's close to a 100 or 200 pounds and other years it's close to a thousand pounds that is a challenge to do that management in that kind of situation so how do you set stocking rate amidst this incredible variability and this is where the art and science of range management comes along yes it's a science we can measure these things but it's really an art to figure out how do you really go about raising livestock in this amount of variability so going back to this idea of variation from year to year, how might you accomplish that? Well, one idea is to try to really be nimble and flexible. Ranchers that do this try to keep only about a little more than half of their herd in breeding stock in cows and calves or sheep and lambs. Then they also, they always kind of a, um, have a, a part of the stocking rate that could be accomplished in good years with steers or stalker animals. So that's one way to be flexible. Another, another thing you could be flexible with is to having early year weaning in years that when it's a bad year, you can wean calves off a little early. If you just really are dead set against having a really same amount of cattle from year to year, that fits into your lifestyle, it just seems right to you. For whatever reason, you want to have a stocking rate that stays really level from, stay, from year to year. If you want to do that, just think about the fact that you're going to need to set stocking rate well below carrying capacity. So the herd should be set so that it could be it could survive at times when you're 25 percent below average knowing that some years you might also have to supplement and do some other things uh, that will be the price you pay for having a constant stocking rate now two words that we should distinguish overgrazing is not overstocking so when you're driving down the road and you see a pasture that seems really like there's just not much forage there um, it may not be overgrazed. It might be that the area was just really heavily grazed for some management procedure, um, like weed control or something. Um, but overgrazing occurs when you have that repeated heavy grazing that will really um, create damage in the plant community. Overstocking, on their hand, is just really heavy stocking during a very specific time of year, so that it looks very observable, but we don't know that it's overgrazing until it causes damage. So overstocking does not always lead to overgrazing. In fact, sometimes overstocking is an important management decision. <clears throat> On the other side of the coin, remember that um, rangelands are grazed ecosystems and overresting or excessive resting from grazing can also be a problem. Some uh, areas, I've seen it in riparian areas and a few kind of high precipitation areas where if it's not grazed, it just isn't healthy. The plants can't come, get, can't come up through that thatch and you can see a situation where the, the plants just don't seem very healthy. So excessive resting can be as bad as overgrazing. All this is fine and good, but I think the way it should work on range is you set a stocking rate and then monitor, monitor, monitor. See if you're on track. So uh, do it by trial and error for a few years and then monitor range trend. Uh, use caution if you're just estimating carrying capacity. Combined utilization measurements and interpretations of the range, knowledge of past and present stocking rates. Monitor, meaning go out there, take some photos, do some collections to see if you're on track. 
and then adjust when needed. So that's the idea is that range management is not about just setting a perfect stocking rate and walking away. It's about setting a reasonable stocking rate and then seeing if it was right and making changes as necessary. So those are just a few principles of stocking rate and how it's set. And the next step, of course, will be getting down to brass tacks and actually deciding how many animals to put on the land for how long.